morning. My name is Ken Nash. So grateful to see you here and those of you online as well. Uh, don't we have just an incredible uh, team of leaders and volunteers who just use their gifts? Even that video was just produced in-house. In fact, your generosity allowed us to build this extra suite over here, which is all for technology. So we can tell video testimonies and we can do live or music like that that can go to all of our campuses. So thank you for your generosity and thank you for all of those that volunteer and just an incredible ministry. So grateful for that. It's really amazing. And if you haven't seen that, we can get some people to show you around if you're, ever, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. It, it's fantastic. So, um, And uh, um, anyway, let me get to what I want to talk about today. This is good stuff. So we, uh, we have just been inundated with the midterm elections. Anybody glad that's over? Kind of, yes, it's behind us now. What drives me nuts about election season is you have these candidates who walk around and they have their hard hats on as they go through the factory plant saying, I am one of you, I understand. And, and I'm like, <laughs> take your Harvard Law degree and shove it because it's so frustrating to me because there's all this illusion of identity. There's not real identification. You're not really one of us in those moments. And so it, it's kind of disingenuous. What I love about the Christmas season and why we put so much energy into the Christmas season is because there is this truth and depth of who our God is. He didn't just come up with this identity or illusion of identity. Our God identifies with us. And I want to prove that to you today and show you how this impacts all aspects of our lives. This series is called Down to Earth, where we're trying to figure out how to be and how God came down to earth and is down to earth. We saw that with Mary last week, how we sometimes revere her. She was one of us. She is just a human being who did extraordinary things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when God identifies with us, we can face life differently. Listen to how it's worded in Philippians. This is Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Our God identifies with us at a base level of our human experience. In fact, that phrase, made himself nothing, in the Greek is the word morphe, which is where we get the word metamorphos, like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Jesus left the glory of heaven to morphe, to become fully like us, so that he doesn't have the illusion of identity, but truly identifies with our lives. And today I want to show you four places in Scripture that show how his life intersects with our complex human story. Let me take you through the first one. Jesus, coming down to earth, understands my daily work. I talked about this, the education of a young Jewish boy several months ago. I just want to repeat this real quickly because this was the pattern Jesus went into. The Bet Sefer is the first layer of education if you're a Jewish boy in, in, in that um, first century culture. Bet Sefer literally stands for the house of the book. And so they would study the Bible. They would, in fact, memorize the Torah from ages 6 to 10. They were memorizing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Some of us can't even get through it without saying, I'm done. There's too much to read. Especially when you get to numbers and trying to so-and-so begat, so-and-so began. So -and, -so began so and they memorized it from at ages 6 to 10. I'm thinking, I barely got my times tables figured out by age 10. Like, this was awesome education. Stress-induced, I'm sure. After Bet Sefer, you see on the screen that the Talmud was the next one, which was the, from ages roughly 10 to 14. This is when you become a Torah scholar. This is when you take the foundation of the memorization, and now you move into critical thinking. So during from age 10 to 14, you learn how to ask questions. And so if you're in math, for example, you would literally, what's 2 plus 2? The answer would maybe be something like this. What's 16 divided by 4? 
you're finding ways to look at similar answers from different angles. That's why Jesus, in fact, our last series, questions Jesus asks. Jesus knew how to ask questions to get us to understand and have critical thinking, and this came out of his season of education. For the best of the best, then, would go to the last one you see up here, the Bet Midrash. This is when you become a student of the sage, and this would be the ones, the best of the best, would move into becoming a future rabbi. And so you would become like your rabbi. While you're doing that, you're plowing your father's trade. Jesus' dad was a carpenter. And we watch actually some mockery happen in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Listen to this. The people are looking at Jesus and they say, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? In other words, they were kind of putting him down. Can anything good come out of his story? He's just a carpenter. He can't be the savior of the world. I know there's rumors going around, but he's just a carpenter. Well, I want to first look at what was it to be a carpenter. I think about this. It, they didn't have these kind of plug-in machines where you can, you know. I mean, you have to be a stud to be a carpenter. It's more like a stonemason. He would have to have intense strength. And so Jesus wasn't frail and weak. He had to go through muscle aches and pains. He had to build his muscle to be able to be a carpenter. While you have all this kind of tension around the concept of uh, he's, he's just a carpenter, which I'll talk about in the next point, you have this incredible experience of Jesus showing us, I understand what it's like to have a nine-to-five job. I understand pay disputes. I understand the profit and loss reports. I understand tension with, with customers. I understand deadlines. I understand TGIF kind of moments, I'm sure. You know, and I've often wondered, the TGIF, I wonder if Jesus was like TMIF, like, thank me it's Friday. You know, I almost wonder if he had that kind of attitude. He knew what it was like to have the case of the Mondays. To wake up and go back or on, sun, on Sunday after Sabbath on Saturday. And it's like, ah, oh, he gets it. I, many times um, people have this feeling of like, nobody understands the pressures I feel at work. The whole point to this first point is this. The answer is, you are wrong if you think nobody understands. Because frankly, Jesus says, I understand. I've been there. I understand the pressures that people feel when it comes to the everyday pressures of work. Jesus wasn't just a carpenter for a day or so. He was at least a decade of his life. He was a carpenter. And so he had all sorts of pressure around the day-to-day -day operations of work. So when you say nobody understands, Jesus does. That's the brilliance of our God identifying with us through the coming of Christ. We don't have a distant God who just says, good luck with that. We have a God who intimately understands the pressures that come in dealing with the day-to-day -day operations of the stresses of school and the stresses of work. To me, that brings me great comfort. That leads to another concept that shows up in Scripture, and we're going to keep in Matthew 6 here for a minute, or in Mark 6, Jesus not only understands my work, Jesus understands my relationships. If you have tension in your home right now, this may bring tremendous hope and some peace to your soul, I hope. Listen to this, going back to Mark 6. Again, the mockery that may have been in the voice of the people. Listen, Jesus returned to his hometown, and they said, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? There was sarcasm all over that statement because of the way Jesus responds. Jesus told them, a prophet is not honored everywhere, or a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his own family. It's like the people were saying, wait a minute, he, he is, he's potentially the Messiah? I changed his diaper 30 years ago. There's no way he could be the Messiah. There's small-town gossip all over this. You can hear people saying, kind of whispering under their breath, wait a minute, do you remember when Mary was pregnant? There was, it was like scandalous. There was all this tension. Like they, they weren't even married at the time. What in the world? He's the Messiah? There's no way. So there's tension all around town. 
And if you're a parent, this may bring a lot of encouragement because you think about the tension that may have even been in the home. So Jesus, we know in Scripture, there's three siblings named. There's, there's James, Jude, and Simon. There's also references that can lead to the potential of two other brothers and two other sisters. So there's potentially eight siblings that are in the home. I mean, you think you have a problem getting to the bathroom. You know, I mean, there's tension between them. And imagine if Jesus, the Messiah, is your brother. Tell me there's not sibling rivalry going on all over this story. Jesus understands the tension that can, can, the breeding ground that can happen in a family like that. There had to have been moments of tension. There had to have been moments of competition and sibling rivalry. And it reminds me of a, a, um, a sister and a brother that were fighting and they were so disappointed. Like the sister was like, come on outside. All you do is play video games all day long. Come on out and play. And so the boy didn't want to. He wanted to play his video games. And so the sister went to the mom and the mom came over and said, son, just go out and play. You can't play video games for your life. You're going to end up being 30 years old, living in your mom's basement, playing video games. And the kid said, I can only dream. <laughs> like, you, you have this tension in the family. And, and I think Jesus understands when there's tension between a brother and a sister and the tension of a parent. And if you're a parent, you may sometimes feel like, I don't ever get it right. Well, here's good news. Our God understands that. All you have to do is look at the first page of the Bible, the first couple pages of the Bible. And you see right from the beginning God has two children, Adam and Eve. Guess what happened? Both of them rebelled. Like if our God, our perfect heavenly father, has rebellious children, maybe we should take a little bit of pressure off from ourselves and say, I, if God can't get it perfectly right raising children, how can I? And so we can know that our God understands the hurt that happens when your kids disobey, when your kids rebel from time to time. It's hard to parent. It's hard to have family. It's hard to have family dynamics at times. But our God says, I understand. And that brings me tremendous hope and encouragement. And think about Jesus then as he started his public ministry. He had 12 disciples. Do you think they got along all the time? I can guarantee the disciples didn't get along all the time. One, we know in Scripture there's some fights and feuds. But even just imagine the personality types around the room. You have Matthew, the tax collector. What does a tax collector believe in politically? Big government. Why? Because he would want the government to expand so that he can collect more taxes. He's for sure going to be in that camp. That's his livelihood. Then you have Judas Iscariot, who was a part of the Iscari, and we have this, he was all, many believe, he was all about the overthrowing of the government. So he was all about get rid of the government. Can you imagine what it was like around the, around the fire, eating dinner at nights? Can you imagine the political fights and feuds? Can you imagine the tension? And that's just two of the characters in the scriptures. Like, these 12 men were real men with real feelings, with real identities, with real personal opinions. And they came at each other from time to time. Jesus understands complex relationships. That gives me tremendous peace. To know that I'm not alone. The, again, the genius of God coming into this world to come down to earth, to be down to earth, to say, I understand the tension you feel right now between you and that other person. I understand when there's sarcasm. I understand when there's gossip. And I understand when there's selfish friends and when there's betrayal. I know the complexity of human relationships. Lean on me. I can take you to places that I understand where you're at right now. It's an incredible gift. There's a, a third aspect as we realize Jesus understands our daily work. Jesus understands the complexity of relationships. Jesus also understands the temptations that we feel. When sin comes so radically at us at times and you feel trapped and tripped up by the desires of the flesh and the desires of the heart. I look at this in Hebrews 2. Because Jesus suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are also being tempted. In other words, Jesus was tempted. 
in every way. That literally tells me he can help us when we are tempted. And temptations come at us all the time. They come at us to cheat, to steal, to lie, to be greedy. Temptation to not forgive somebody who hurts you. Temptation to have hate instead of love. We all feel the temptations. Again, here's the good news. Jesus understands the temptations of our heart. I think heavily today, as, as I've had different conversations with people around the issue of lust, our, our culture bombards us around this issue of uh, the porn industry it continues to find new inroads to hurt people and trap people. Do you realize in Scripture, one way that Jesus helps us around this topic, he says every time in Scripture that the issue of lust shows up, he literally says in different ways, flee. Run away. The temptation is too much because temptation will hit you no matter where you're at. Like this one kid I heard of, he was at a camp and he was, and maybe you've heard this, it's become somewhat of a, a famous story now of this boy. The, the camp concept for the week, you know how summer camps have themes? This theme was there are no problems, there are only opportunities. Of course, it was trying to get kids to think out of the box on how to, to take on the problems of this world. And uh, this one boy, he came up to the dean right away and he said, uh, Dean, I, I, have, I have a problem. And the dean didn't even ask him anything. He just pointed to the phrase, there are no problems, there are only opportunities. To which the boy replied, well, I was going to tell you that there's a girl accidentally assigned to my cabin. But I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> oh, man, you can't even go to a fantastic camp without temptation coming at you. And so you, you get what I'm saying. And in Scripture, God always says, I will help you when these temptations come your way. And if this is an area of temptation for you, in Proverbs, for example, I'll give you one angle on how God helps us as we study the Scriptures. In Proverbs 6, it says, make here's great wisdom, make decisions around temptation in this way when it's high noon, when you're at church, when you're level-headed, when you're not filled with the lusts of the flesh and the temptation. And so make your decisions when it's high noon because then it goes on to say, any woman looks attractive after the sun goes down and she, is, says it, will reduce you to a loaf of bread. In our common vernacular, that would mean, dude, you're toast. Make the decisions today in church while we're level-headed saying, I'm not going to go down that road. So that when you come into that time of temptation, you've learned how to already flee. That's one tangible way God says, I will help you. Just lean on me. In fact, Hebrews says it even further, two chapters later in Hebrews 4.14. Let us cling, let us cling to Jesus and never stop trusting him. He understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same temptations that we do, and yet he did not sin. Again, our God understands the temptations when they come our way. What does it mean to cling? Let's think really tangibly. When you have moments of temptation to say, you know what, I'm never going to forgive her. Or somebody's piling on the gossip and you go, oh really? Do tell. And you join in with the, the gossip. That's temptation coming your way. Well, God promises, I will help you out of that time. So let me cling to Jesus who's already felt that same temptation, but he never fell into the traps of sin. So how do I cling to Jesus? Well, in those moments, it would be the spirit of saying, Lord, renew my mind. Help me think your thoughts. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. If I were to have a glass bowl up here that just had a lid on it, it was covered, and I said, this glass bowl is filled with a poisonous gas. And if I were to drop it and break it, you'd be like, ah! There's all this gas going everywhere. Well, the question is, how would you ever diffuse that? Well, the answer is, you fill it with more good. You fill it to overflowing with good oxygen. You dilute it. You diffuse it. 
That's what God is saying. When, when you're struggling with temptation, look into the eyes of God and say, God, help me right now. Pray the prayer. Lord, I'm just asking. I'm clinging to you. I don't even know how to do this, but I'm asking you, renew my mind. Fill me with your spirit. What will happen is the filling of the spirit will dilute and diffuse that which is tempting you. And he'll recenter your thoughts. He'll recenter your heart because our God understands. Jesus was tempted in every way to experience life exactly as we have experienced it. So we don't have an aloof God who is out there distant. He says, cling to me. I've been there. I understand what it means to feel the pressures that come your way and the temptations to stray. And I will lead you as a, as a good shepherd, will guide you and keep you from the wolves. What a gift that is. So as we think about this, you've got the, all the complexity of work, school pressure, the pressure of relationships, the pressure of temptation to stray and follow your own path, those pale in comparison. They're all essential and important that our God understands that. But for me personally, number four brings all of it together to realize I serve a good, good father. We follow a God who is so deeply in love with us that he wants to help us even, number four, in our pain. Jesus understands the work pressures and, and pressures of temptation and pressures of relationships, but I love the fact that he understands our pain. There is a lot of pain that I'm sensing around Cornerstone. The conversations I'm hearing, the prayer requests, the, the messages on, on social media, there's just a lot of hurt, a lot of tears. And my heart grieves for us as a church and as a community and as a nation, frankly. But here's what gives me such peace today. Our God understands that kind of pain. I have a, uh, a friend who has a great perspective on life. He says, you know, I've found in life that it's just the first 100 years that are the toughest. <laughs> Once you get beyond the first hundred years, you'll be just fine. <laughs> I'm like, that's a that's pretty good perspective on life because there are a lot of bumps and bruises in this world. But our God says, you know, I will fill you and help you in your pain. Like Jesus grieved, wept, it literally says wept over the death of his friend Lazarus. And I'm so glad that's in the scriptures. There are as it says in John, there are so if if everything that Jesus experienced was written down in the scriptures, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain. Like, but God gave us these little details, and one of the details was he wept over Lazarus. He wept over Jerusalem when he, he walked up and he looked at his people and he and he just wept and he said, They don't understand. After all these years of me pouring into them, they still don't understand. And he just wept. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was, he was weeping. And just before he faced the cross, it says that he sweat drops of blood. Physically, we've talked about this, it's called hemo, hematohydrosis, which literally means his capillaries burst. He was under so much emotional and spiritual pressure that he literally had some of his capillaries burst to where it says he sweat drops of blood. He understands pain. So much so that it says it this way in, in Isaiah 53. He, talking about the Messiah, this is an Old Testament prophecy of Jesus coming, he was despised and rejected. Jesus understands what it means to be despised and rejected. Familiar with the bitterest of grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised and we did not care. He was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might be healed. All of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's path to follow our own. And yet, God laid on the Messiah, Jesus, the guilt of us all. Jesus is familiar with the bitterest of grief. When we rejected him, even in his love for us, we still put our hand up saying, I still don't want to follow at times. That rejection, he understands when you feel rejected. He understands when you feel a sense of, I don't fit in. 
I don't understand how to face this world anymore. Jesus says, I understand. And it's beautiful. And it's so encouraging. I, I, um, I got permission from a guy who was saying, um, you know, my world, as he was just describing why he has so many struggles today, he said, um, the reason I'm, and I'm starting to put pieces together, and it's, it's so hard, but I, I don't necessarily know how to navigate this, but God is starting to show these things to me. As, as I was growing up, I was, for 18 years of my formative years, I was in a, el- a family alcoholic situation, and my mom and dad sometimes were drunk, and they, they just, sometimes it was beautiful, and sometimes it was horrible, and he said, to describe my childhood, each day I would come home, I didn't know if I was going to be hugged or slugged. I just hurt, and I don't know how to navigate this, but as I've been following Jesus, I'm realizing My Savior understands. Like, God has been there. He's not a distant God. And that, to me, makes all the difference in my complex and your complex journey following God. He's come down to earth to be able to connect with us in an intimate and beautiful way. I uh, uh, heard a story of a young boy who was um, in grade school. Um, um, He had an accident one day where he accidentally wet his pants. He didn't know how to handle the moment. And, I I mean, he had light jeans on, and one was suddenly dark, one is light. And he's like, I am in so much trouble. And so he got those sweaty palms. His his brow started to sweat because he's like, "I the recess bell is about to go off. How am I going to hide this? I am totally busted. My, all my friends are going to mock me like he's terrified. All of a sudden, just before the bell rang, this girl carrying the fishbowl from the class, you know how classes get like turtles and fishes and they kind of adopt these animals? He, she accidentally spilled this um, fishbowl water all over the boy. I mean, it went on his desk, on his paperwork, went on his clothes. He is now drenched. So this kid who went from instant guaranteed ridicule from his friends now went to the ultimate focus of pity. And the girl now is mocked. You're so messy, you don't even know how to carry a fishbowl. You're so foolish. And, and she apologized to him, and he said, no, 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 it's okay. No problem at all. I'm so grateful. And he said to her, you have no idea how much you just helped me. And she leaned over when nobody was listening, and she whispered into his ear, I used to accidentally wet my pants too. She had seen his predicament, and she took the shame upon herself by pouring the water on him to be able to protect him. That's such a beautiful illustration of our God. Our God looks at our situation, and he doesn't say, well, that's what you get for being rebellious punks. He looks at us, and he says, how can I cover you? How can I care for you? How can I rescue you from this situation? That's how much our God loves us because he looks at our pain and he says, I want to do things in and through you that, that can only happen when you look at me and cling to me. That's why we celebrate at Christmas time because Jesus fully understands the human story and it just changes us and it carries us and it holds us. And, and I know I, I, I've had enough conversations and Sessions of conversation with people to know there's a lot of judgment toward God, a lot of hatred toward God, a lot of hurt because of the circumstances of life. But can I, can I encourage you, just during the Christmas season, just for the next few weeks, could you put your judgment aside and any fist shaking or hatred that you may have for, toward God, saying, why did you take that person from me? Why did this happen? Instead of judging God for what happened then, could you do me a favor and try something just to change your thinking a little bit? Let's start judging God, not for what happened in the past, but if, you're, if, you're in, if you have a disposition toward judging God, Would you start judging God for what he's going to do next versus what already happened? Because I'm convinced what already happened 
has happened because we are a rebellious people who have free will. And love only has purpose if it has a choice. So God gave us free will to choose to love God or not because love is no good if it's not given freely. And so in our free will, we hurt one another. And for us to blame God for all the hurts of the world is to miss the heart of God and to put the blame in the wrong places. So instead of blaming God for not rescuing us from the past, what if we judge God? If you feel that you're compelled to judge, why not judge God for what he does next? Because here's what God is going to do. We serve the God of the resurrection. And it is through pain that God redeems. It is through death that we can see the greatest resurrection. Miracles happen when some of the toughest circumstances occur. The miracles occur coming out of the pain. And so while God grieves, and here's a promise to you, listen to this in Romans 8, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. This is Romans 8, 26. When you are weak, he helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Our God grieves and weeps and prays on our behalf when we don't even know how to pray. That's the God who resurrects and brings healing. And it goes on to say, I will, this is my favorite, Romans 8, 28, And we know that in all things, God works for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In other words, God's going to bring something good from it. That's why one of the key phrases we have around Cornerstone, if your situation, your story is not good, God's not done. Because our God identifies with our pain, with our hurts, with our pressure, and he brings it to good when due time is ready. And so I want to see the resurrection, and I hope you do as well. So I want to pray over us, and uh, I'm going to invite the band to come out, and as they do, we have a chance to sing in response to say, thank you, God, for your goodness in all of this. Uh, I want to pray over us. Lord, I pray right now, if there is anyone here that they just want to quit on work or school, they just can't take the, the frustration of those environments, I pray, God, that you have today reinstilled hope in them. For anyone that's struggling with relationships and the unforgiveness and the hurts and the the pain that happens because of deep, frustrating relationships, God, I thank you that you understand and can speak into us today about that. For those that are struggling with temptation and the sin that is eroding any of our souls, I pray, God, that you can just, again, remind us you love us and you want to renew us and refresh our spirit again today. And for the deep amount of pain that we feel, God, thank you that you're the God of the resurrection. I thank you that you bring good out of the pain. I thank you that you are the one who brings healing when we need to be rescued by your Holy Spirit. And so I thank you for the gift of what you've just taught us in the scriptures. And I pray our spirits are open to what you want to do next in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.